Hello, this is Sierra O'Connell with the San Juan Preservation Trust. And I'm out here walking on the shore of the Salish Sea in the northwest corner of Washington State. This is False Bay on beautiful San Juan Island. And I'm especially excited because I'm gonna spend the day with the world-renowned marine biologist, Dr. Drew Harvelt. I can't wait to see this low tide environment through her eyes. Hello, Dr. Harvell. Thank you so much for letting me join you today. Hey, Sierra. Good morning. Thanks for being here in my favorite place, Fault Bay. Beautiful day. I'm just finishing up some sampling. Let me show you what I got, though. Ooh, I already got cool. a really good worm. This nice. is sort of the spot for worms. And this is just really a kind of a good sized, Whoa. really nice lugworm. This guy is a big burrower. Oh, pretty, actually. Yeah, it's really <laughs> pretty. Look at that. You can see the red gills all along the edge. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at that. <laughs> see how it sort of inflates that part for, for burrowing. It's trying to burrow in my hand. That's crazy. It uses that proboscis as kind of a battering ram to you know, burrow into the sediment, and then it'll inflate the little sections behind it. Oh, there he goes. Yeah, and what are these spikes? Yeah, out? so those are the CT that it uses to grip the inside of its it's burrow. No way. So this aberanicola is what creates all the castings um, around here. And these worms are really common here. They're also ecologically very important. The castings reflect that they're, they're actually bioturbating, and that means that they're like an earthworm. They're digging in the mud, they're processing it, and uh, spitting it out the other end, which continues to essentially make highways of nutrients underneath the sediment surface here in Faults Bay. So this is just one example of the There's... kind of biodiversity of worms we have in here, and it's one reason this area is so rich. Well, let's dig some more. Uh, here, you can have this. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to try to dig fast, okay? Because um, sometimes they the burrows are deep. So let's see what we got here. Uh, well, here's one little tiny one, but uh, I'm not sure which guy that is. It's not the one we were looking for, but that's one of those species, a very tiny, unidentified species of worm. Um, can't can't say for sure. Actually, oh my gosh, I can say what it is. It's a glycerid. Oh, did you see that? That was its proboscis. Um, I can see and on the tip of that proboscis wow. are uh, harpoon-like envenomated jaws. And so it's, this is an active predator. It trundles around under the sand looking for other annelids, other worms, and then throws out its proboscis and uh, nabs them. Oh! oh isn't that that's great? crazy. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> All right, let's dig some more. Oh, what's that? Well, that one is not a worm. It's a ghost shrimp. There are so many of these here. All of these holes are this ghost shrimp. Look at this guy, what a spectacular critter. Look at this enormous kila. So isn't this just a beautiful shrimp? Look at the fantastic claw. <laughs> I think we should uh, keep digging and put this guy, let him go. That's because I want to check for the presence of one other species. Oh, look, there it is. So this oh, is what I was hoping wow. for. So this is one of the big nereid worms that we have here. This hmm. guy is an amazing burrower. This guy can do everything. It burrows, it swims, it crawls. Okay, I really hope it tries to bite me because it's kind of spectacular, the size of the jaws on these. So it has a huge proboscis and at the end of it, are these really nasty looking jaws. Come on you, bite. Oh, there we go. There it goes. Oh. <laughs> Did you see the jaws? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, a lot of, we got 
got a lot of worm here. Whoa. Look at all the parapodia for swimming. These are just these huge paddle-like projections on this guy. Look at how fast he burrows. We are not letting you get away. Okay, now I'm going to take him back. Now we've cleaned him up. I mean, you can see what a gorgeous worm that is, right? How pretty. So this is an omnivorous worm. It both eats algae and also eats other small worms. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just a big, big, beautiful worm. He's running backwards. Yeah. <laughs> So we'll put this one back, but there that was one of our big finds. So is this an ordinary thing? Can people just come out and dig like this? Well, no. Of course, I'm digging here now to sample worms with permission from the University of Washington. Since this is a biological preserve, this kind of digging isn't normally allowed. The University of Washington owns the entire bay, purchased at a sheriff's auction in 1974. And Part of the reason they did that is 10 years before, there was an attempt to develop a community out here. There was an attempt, a proposal to have 400 houses on sand berms. And that would have been a travesty for, for this kind of really valuable biotic marine habitat. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> How is it that we're able to stand on the seafloor and walk out here like this? Well, one of the amazing things at our fairly high latitudes here is there's a very large tidal range. So the tide, there may be a you know, 8 to 20 foot range in the tide as it goes out at low tide and then comes back and fills the bay. And then the, I mean, the, the startling thing here is it's such a shallow bay that the entire bay empties out because there's not more than an 8 foot difference in depth. Oh, there's a crab! Oh, yeah, that looks like a green shore crab. It's Hemigrapsis oregonensis. Oh, and there's another one. And then there's another one right there. Yeah, look at them. There's probably, I don't know, five or six within just a couple of meters of us. If you multiply that across this bay, oh, there's probably tens of thousands of them. They're very common. They're really active crab, and they like to eat this algae. So they're herbivores. And then there's got to be at least 10 other species of crab here and well over 15 species of worms. So the biological productivity in this bay is just staggering. And now, while the tide is out, there are two other ecological zones I want to show you. And for that, we are walking to the mouth of the bay So now I want to show you the next habitat. We're here, so now we climb. This is the beginning of the second part of a treasure hunt where we're exploring the tide pools in Faults Bay and there's yet a completely different set of biota living in these tide pools. Oh, yep. Um, what's that? Oh, look. So that's a tide pool sculpin and there's actually several species in these tide pools. Oh, and here's another one. Oh, look. It looks... Yep. So that's one of the, the greener ones. And they're, they're eating invertebrates, so they love all the little amphipods and other crustaceans in these tide pools. Yeah, they're very cryptic. They're, they blend right in to the background. But you start look seeing at that. more Whoa. and more. <laughs> <laughs> there's like, there's probably 30 of them. Cool. An area like this is referred to as a rocky intertidal zone. And I have a feeling this really large tide pool is going to have a lot of hidden treasures. So if we just kind of gradually look along all of the edges, we're on the search for things that are small, interesting, and just basically wonderful. You never know what's going to be underneath the eelgrass here. Oh, well, there we go. So one of our most important predators in tide pools and in our subtitle are the starfish. So this is Crossaster paposus, which is uh, a multi-armed sea star. And you can see it's a really gorgeous, uh, gorgeous star. Uh, and I'm um, just gently kind of pulling, pulling up its arm to show you what it looks like underneath. Uh, 
So those are all the tube feet that it uses in its mouth. It's actually got something it's been eating. Uh, uh, food goes in the mouth here and into the stomach. And some of them even avert their stomachs and digest their prey outside their bodies and then take them in. So just a really stunningly beautiful critter. Fun, fun to find in this tide pool. Um, so almost all of the sea stars are predatory. So they're wandering, wandering through these tide pools, eating uh, a lot of the snails, the anemones, um, some of the chitons, uh, some of the barnacles. So we're just gonna pull the grass back over it so that it's hidden, hidden from that sun, which can be damaging. Nice, what a nice find. Oh, what is this yellow guy? Oh, wow, that is a lemon nudibranch. What an amazing find. And you know, the reason the nudibranchs here is because there are also sponges in these tide pools. Mm -hmm and that's what this species eats. Uh -huh. So uh, it's a specialist predator on, on sponges, and even though sponges are really toxic, a lot of them have kind of bad chemicals in them, nudibranchs are chemist magicians. They can detoxify the chemicals, and sometimes they use them in their own defense. Right. And so that's, that's why they're so brightly colored, because they're warningly colored. And this one here eats our common, our common yellow sponge, and of course it's a, it's a bright yellow uh, nudibranch. And you can see there on the, the front, it has uh, its rhinophores, those are its sensory structures. And then on the back end of the nudibranch, those are a frilly gills, mm -hmm. set of gills. And uh, that's what's distinctive for that group. Okay. And not only that, uh, it's laying eggs for us. So this is how they reproduce. They lay egg masses. And inside that egg mass are hundreds of tiny little embryos that will develop in the egg mass. Then they will hatch and they will spend another couple of weeks in the plankton before eventually <laughs> coming back and turning into a little tiny nudibranch. So it's kind of really exciting that we were able to sort of see a part of the life cycle here as we look into this tide pool. All right, so let's see. Okay, look at that little sculpin. What are you doing? What's under there? Let's see. Oh, that's a, oh, that's a really pretty one. <laughs> we found some good stuff. There he is. Oh. oh, I wanted this one. It's Idatea. Normally I see it with eelgrass, but you can see there is eelgrass in this tide pool. And it's one of the big herbivores that feeds on this plant. Woo, look at him go. And we're actually, there are experiments running at Friday Harbor Labs by my PhD student right now, seeing not only how much eelgrass it eats, but whether it vectors the disease. Does it bite a little bit on this plant and then spread it to another plant? So we're spending some time with this critter. Let's put him back under his rock. Um, the other thing, of course, you can see the beautiful sea anemones in here. This is Anthopleura elegantissima, the beautiful pink-tipped sea anemone. And oh, look what I think I found down here. It looks like a very tiny chitin. Oh, look at that one. So that's Mopelia right here, a little chitin. It's got these eight plates. And of course, what I always like to talk about is what, this, what these guys eat. So this is an herbivore. It feeds on algae and it helps keep the tide pool cleaned. And while we're talking about herbivores, perhaps the most important herbivore in our waters is this green urchin. And it's got one heck of a name, Strongylocentrotus drobachiensis, AKA the green urchin. And uh, again, it's doing its work, working through the tide pool, uh, grazing on the algae. And of course, it's just about to walk over this other chitin, again, this Catharina tunicata. And nearby is a snail, actually, oops, nope, it's a hermit crab. So uh, here's a hermit crab in this tide pool, 
in this snail shell using it as a home. Got a cute little shrimp here cruising around the tide pool. Uh, so we've just stumbled on this one tide pool that is filled with amazing diversity uh, of invertebrates. And that now you can really see why this is such a rich area. Oh, look at this guy coming out. There's actually three hermit crabs right there. And that one's without a shell, so you can see its legs. Oh, look, there's another cluster of anemones. And is that a nudibranch? Oh, look. So that's a Dora nudibranch. I think it's Dialula sandiagensis. And it's just trucking around the tide pool looking for food. They're, they're voracious predators, right? These, I think of these as the lions of the intertidal because they can eat, you know, mm. all sorts of things. This one eats sponges, but some of them eat uh, other kinds of prey. It's distinguished by having these frilly gills all around the back end. And then on the front, that's where its antennae are for, for sensing and very happy uh, in this tide pool. And it's really a beautiful find. Normally we wouldn't find this guy so, uh, so easily in a tide pool, but these, it's a really low tide. So we're finding some great stuff that's gotten trapped in these pools by the low tide. Oh, look under this ledge. So there's a bunch of snail eggs here and look at all the snails. They're aggregating, mating and laying eggs here. So all of these are the eggs laid by this guy, what? Nucella, and they're all reproducing and producing this aggregate bunch of eggs together. And this is a predatory snail. Uh, it feeds on barnacles. And uh, the reason I know it's a predator, it has this siphonal canal here um, that the siphon comes out of. And right now it's tucked in with its operculum closed, but mm -hmm. uh, at low tide. So you can see here's one of these nucella up here among all these baby barnacles. Kind of quiet now while the tide is out, but when the tide comes in, it will be eating, drilling holes in all these barnacles and eating them. Hmm. Well, Sierra, amazing though this has been, I have a surprise. We've got one more habitat. Awesome. We're going to walk all the way across the mouth of the bay to get to the last special place. So let's just think about it as we're walking across the sand. In just a little while, the tide is going to be reversing direction. And it's something like 2 million cubic meters of seawater is going to flow right across the sand wow. and over the course of just a few hours it's going to refill this entire bay so i don't know it's about 500 million gallons of water and of course this is all driven by the moon's gravity and the earth's rotation and so you know in six hours there will be harbor seals hunting here and the water will be nine feet deep. <laughs> cool. Pretty amazing. There's another reason why this place is so special. We are right at the confluence of the Harrow Strait, which channels water north and south, and the Straits of Juan de Fuca, which channels water east and west from the open ocean. And so this is the great crossing of biodiversity from the north and the south. And so we do have unusual numbers of animals and species here. Oh, cool. Well, so this whole area here is the eelgrass. What we're seeing is the intertidal eelgrass exposed. And then there are large meadows all along the front of Fault's Bay. And I think this is our most valuable habitat in Faults Bay. And it's also our research site, so we're studying the health of the eelgrass here. And of course, this is eelgrass, which is an example of seagrasses that live worldwide in tropical and temperate habitats. And so this is our particularly valuable seagrass. Um, 
But worldwide, seagrasses, I like to say, have superpowers. And there's three big things about seagrass meadows. One is uh, their essential marine habitat for a great many species. If we look, I mean, we've had some amazing times here, you know, seining for fish just to count the biodiversity. And there were easily 30 species of fish uh, that we were able to find, you know, gobies and gunnels and perch and baby salmon and sand lance and herring and, <laughs> you know, a lot of great fish. Uh, and then, you know, even on the blades, if you look, there's this gorgeous, gorgeous, we call it an epiphyte because it's a plant that grows on a plant. Uh, this red, red algae, it's almost like Christmas colors on the, against the green of the, of the eelgrass. It's really pretty. Um, so are the epiphytes good for them, bad for them? Does well, it matter to them? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it really depends on the level of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is not a problem. This kind of growing along the edge like that, but when they completely overgrow them, then they become, you know, they interfere with the plants photosynthesizing. But you know, pretty green blades. Um, yeah, these are really healthy. See, beautiful bed. Look at the size. Look at how tall these are. This is almost, you know, three feet high from the bottom where it's growing. Yeah. Um, really healthy, beautiful green um, eelgrass with this pretty, pretty red smithora. Uh, and then as we kind of look down, we'll find other great stuff in here as we continue our treasure hunt into the Ooh, into found. the eelgrass. Oh, look at that. Yeah, nice find. So those are the egg cases of a little tiny snail called lacuna. And I'll try to find one. Oh, there it is. There's a small lacuna here. Oh, there they both are, a lacuna snail and its egg case. I wonder, maybe that one just deposited those eggs. Um, so, there's another really cool relative of the lacuna. I'm looking for a sea slug called Phyloplegia. It's re I hope we can find one because they're really pretty. They're striped, green striped sea slugs. Oh, there we go. Oh. Um, so there it is. It's, I don't want to pull it out of the water, but it's on that blade. And you can just see the really so amazing cute. stripes. I mean, how beautiful is that? It's perfectly cryptic. Uh, it's an herbivore, mm -hmm. so it lives only in eelgrass beds. Uh, and these guys are running around this time of year looking for mates and laying egg cases all over the eelgrass. And here, here's one of those egg cases. You can okay. see what that looks like there. Oh, awesome. Yeah, wow, so it's just cool. sort of glued on to the, to the eelgrass. And inside that egg case are these little tiny embryos that will eventually turn into sea slugs. And you know, all these little, all these bubbles, mm -hmm. that's oxygen, oh, right? Nice. Because these are photosynthesizing. So that's one thing that makes an eelgrass bed so healthy. It's creating, you know, high oxygen for the critters that live in it. It's killing natural um, pathogens or diseases in the water because a lot of those bacteria don't do well with high oxygen. And that leads back to how important eelgrass beds are. The second superpower that seagrass affords is that it actually mitigates climate change. Seagrass actually absorbs carbon dioxide and then locks it up mm -hmm. in the sediments. And so it's, it's sort of a valuable blue carbon uh, sort of offset for, for global climate change. And the third superpower of eelgrass is that they actually clean the water around them. They can clean pollutants from the water, they can detoxify uh, bacterial pathogens and make both humans and our natural biota healthier. And so that's kind of what I mean when I say they're superpowers. Uh, so it's just a incredibly valuable marine habitat that's that's uh, highly endangered world, worldwide and one that we should all work to protect. 
Well, we sure nailed it in terms of all the biodiversity. I think we should make a list. We must have seen like 40 different species. Just just one little walk here. Yeah, and that's uh, not including the mammals or the birds. Or I know, I know. So these are all the little things that people don't normally see here. Yeah. But really, they're the ones that run the processes, sort of the health of the bay, the biodiversity of the bay, the whole functioning of the bay. And so, um, ecologically, they're really important. Dr. Harvell, thank you so much. I've absolutely loved finding all these amazing creatures here. Learning about their biology and seeing the beauty through your eyes has been wonderful. I just can't believe how much there is to see when you know what to look for. Oh, it's been my pleasure to show you around this wonderful bay. I'm sure you could tell this is one of my very favorite places. And I'm so glad we were able to get a glimpse of very cool invertebrates that live in the intertidal habitat. I mean, as you know, invertebrates are my passion, and I just love being able to show you the things that we found. And it was fun to see how much you appreciated seeing them. But, you know, this particular bay is just one example of many similar places that exist throughout all of the San Juan Islands magical intertidal zones like this with their own spectacular biodiversity exist throughout all of the Salish Sea, the Pacific Coast, I mean our entire planet and so they're all such precious places. <laughs>